often say composers are like dogs. We sniff each other out in public places. We're drawn to each other at events. And there are subcategories of composers who sniff each other out. The, the sound makers, whether it be Hans Zimmer in LA or Olafur in Iceland. And there's an even smaller subcategory of composer, the shed dweller. I'm here today at John Opstadt's shed to have a look at how he uses his troglodytic space to create wonderful sounds, compositions and music for media. Hello, John. Christian, welcome. Fellow shed dweller. Absolutely. How long have you been here? About nine years now. Purpose built? Oh. Yeah, absolutely, yeah. yeah. So just before we come in, you, you've got a kind of a double door. Yes. And is it kind of floated and stuff? Yeah, yeah, so it is designed as a soundproof space, um, which works really nicely. Um, so it was a bespoke thing? Yeah, know. absolutely. So when we moved into the house, um, it was built quite quickly, so we didn't get used to having the extra garden. So it's cut, oh, we yes. cut the garden in half. Yeah. Um, but yeah, built as a place for me to work from home, basically. Brilliant. And do you, do you find that, that that works for you? I really do, yeah. Um, I think also kind of having family and stuff, it really But really it's not the same wise. as working... In. No, I'm, I'm, I'm coming to work here. Yes. Um, I've got no windows on the front, so I can't see that I'm at home. Um, yes. But I've still got natural light from the skylight. Um, so, yeah. And it, that's, it, that's a two-way important kind of boundary, isn't it? Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I'm kind of at work in here. Um, this is where I come to work. But then my commute is extremely short um, to get to get home in the evening and do you find it means that you do just you can snatch important moments yeah yeah absolutely yeah i mean um yeah it works really well because you know when when you've got deadlines and things if i you know i if i yeah if i need to go back to work in the evening for a little bit i can just pop in here and that kind of thing or if there's like yeah just suddenly someone needs some files i can you yes know, e emailed over i can just pop back in here and do that excellent so, yeah, stuff it works really well works really a great well use of space and a great collection of stuff so i mean yeah. I, I guess oh my lord is that an is that an arp it is 2600 wow bought just before i found out that Korg were reissuing it <laughs> <laughs> um but uh yeah no but I'm it's all right it's a long waiting visual. list i believe yes do, do you use uh, i do i, I oh, really yeah i really hear it's really kind of honed to what i use so there have been some other ones that have been and gone but mostly vintage digital that's that's gone Right. Um, you know, there's there's certain synths that I've had and just haven't found a way of integrating them into the way I work. But um, but yeah, all the analog is basically so lovely that it stays. Fantastic! I love the Selena strings. Yeah, yeah. It's My wife's working on an album at the moment and and has been listening to some stuff from the kind of late 60s, early 70s, and I, I keep on saying it's, it's one of those, it's yeah. what you need. There's quite a kind of um, specific scheme to my curation of this synth okay. collection, which I can probably uh, let you know about, which is, oh. I think, um, you're a fellow Herbie Hancock fan, I think, so you probably know that photo pretty well. Well, I've, I Instagrammed <laughs> it about, yeah. about six months ago. That, that for me is everything, that's, that's why that's why for me. Yeah, no, exactly. Well, for me too. So, I mean, basically, you know, with Headhunters, yes. um, I bought by accident when I was nine years old, thinking it was something else. Yes. And just was blown away by the sound of it. And the thing about all the Herbie Hancock albums of that era is that they list all the synths in the inlay card. So, so yes. you know, from a young age, I, just, I was just like, what is an ARP Odyssey? You know what's an ARP pro soloist, and you know all these names just kind of became very embedded in my consciousness. This album, Sunlight, yes. got re-released on CD, and I bought it. And I mean that photo. <laughs> it's still to this day. It, it's just it's so cool. Yeah. So so I've very very gradually been uh, building up that collection basically. Um, so I've I've now got all but two of them. Fantastic. Um, Mate, that is although, so cool. Although one of the last ones is going to be a bit of a hurdle because it's a CS80. Right. So a slight yeah. financial hurdle there. Oh, you actually have a clavinet? I do, yeah. Um, and do you have a wah-wah pedal? I don't. Clavinet is, is a kind of a slightly guilty pleasure because I think there aren't that many times that you can work a clavinet into, <laughs> into a film story. So it's actually, it needs, it needs a good service at the moment. I need right. to get it serviced properly. So I haven't, I haven't used it in anger so far. 
Um, so yeah, maybe a wah wah pedal will be on the cards once that's once that's Amazing. fully serviced. The synths are that's that's the scheme to the the synths, and then it's kind of in a way it's it's coincidental that they work really well for for the kind of scoring that yes. I do and the kind of doors they open up in creativity and the, and the way that you're you're shaping the sound is amazing because I love that for the way I work it just works amazingly well having all these tools to shape sound basically yes because I think that's that's a big side to what we do as composers for film and TV is making sounds is, is a big part of it. Yes. It's not just about dots on a page. And they have their strengths, don't they? Yeah. So, I mean, I, I often see my synths as, as almost like an orchestra. It's like, yes, Absolutely. Wh whilst that can make an oboe sound, it's really the horny pad that you want from, from that thing. Well, <laughs> you're pointing to the Juno, yes. which, I, which uh, I mean, so the Juno actually doesn't, you know, that doesn't fit with the Herbie Hancock scheme. So no. that's, that's, that's a kind of outsider in that respect, but it's probably the synth I use the most. You really can approach it in that thinking as an orchestrator kind of way. Because yes. Um, but then, you know, it's really simple to move from that to much more kind of staccato kind of stuff as well. And then, you're, you know, that's you're kind of thinking as an orchestrator in terms of like pit strings or arco yes. strings. With a lot of the synth stuff, I do approach it from that from that perspective. I think one of the problems I have with plug-in synths is that there's the, op the options are too wide as well, you know. Yes. And you, en you end up choosing a sound from a, a list of presets. Whereas I quite like the fact that with a lot of these, they've got no memory, they've got no patch memory. Yeah. Um, so you're, you're having to create that sound from from scratch, yeah, and it's such a simple synth to use, but just sounds great. And have um, you midied everything? Not everything, no. So the Juno I have converted, and I noticed quite badly. I mean, if you look at the, so I did it myself, and if you look at those holes in the back, they're not. <laughs> it's not perfectly done. You know, so one of the differences between the Juno Six and the Sixty is that the Six doesn't have any way of getting any MIDI or anything into sure. it, whereas with the Sixty you can buy a converter to put in the back. Um, so I bought the kit for converting it. And it was such a stressful experience because I, I stupidly did it myself. And how when how difficult can it be? Eh? Yeah, well, exactly. <laughs> how difficult can it be desoldering a forty-pin, you know, main microprocessor chip that's like the crucial brains of the synth, and then you know a few pins in, realizing you've massively bitten off more than you can chew. Um, and but by that point I just felt I had to carry on and I really thought that I'd just completely broken this beautiful synth um, but it, it worked out okay in the end there was there was a little moment where it felt like I'd completely broken it oh no but, but it did work out so let's have a little kind of scout around yeah. so uh, uh, we, we've got another f uh, film coming out soon where you you talk about this being the absolute centerpiece of a project you've been working on. Yeah, it's not just an upright piano with a felt celeste pedal. It's a disclavier, isn't it's it? It's a disclavier. Yeah, beautiful Yamaha U3 piano, but it's got this little box up here that basically means that you can completely control it via MIDI. I can basically write stuff in Logic. MIDI cable runs to the other side of the room. I can make it play completely unplayable stuff. In fact, I once tried to make it play such unplayable stuff that it blew the power supply. I've had to replace the power supply, but it's a brilliant instrument because it's got yeah, it's got the felt pedal. Um, so yeah, you, I mean, you were saying that this was a, a U3 was the piano that the classic Spitfire felt the piano, soft piano, yeah, soft piano sample was done with. So it's got that real sound to it. And um, but yeah, uh, it's it's just amazing because you can, you know, I can I can send lines into it for it to play and then be like messing around with the strings while it's playing stuff. It's a brilliant idea. Absolutely. So, um, yeah, I've been sticking screws in it and putting gaffer tape on it and muting it with my hands and all sorts of things. Great. But then it's also just a lovely piano to play as well. And I'm only just becoming familiar with these because of the reissue, and they right. really are a thing of... Yeah, I mean, that is a, a thing of beauty. It's it's quite a... Um, yeah, I wouldn't... Of, of the synths in here, I'd say I'm not completely... I haven't quite got to grips with its full capabilities yet. It's, In fact, when I first turned it on, I couldn't work out how to get a sound of it. Oh, I, I love those yeah. things. Just, <laughs> Which is I can see the speakers moving, but I can't actually hear <laughs> any sound. So, um, but yeah, I mean, it's, it's a beautiful instrument and just the, 
you know, at some stage I'm going to really just make some music really exploring what, what that instrument can do. Um, I mean, it's got such such depth to what it's what it's capable of. And, so, so, and it's MIDI up as well, so it's got the, um, the that's a MIDI CV converter that's running oh into great. it. Oh, great. So... Without so, drilling holes into it and unsoldering. Exactly, un ex un yeah, soldering. exactly. I mean, Chip. I definitely wouldn't want to do that with, with that one. So something I've learned today is the ARP and the ARP Odyssey are not the same thing, and that is, in fact, the ARP Odyssey, isn't it? Yeah, that's actually, that is a Korg reissue, um, okay. which is, um, yeah, which sounds great. So, yeah, I bought They're that. doing great, thing called, great yeah. things, Korg, aren't they? Yeah, so we've got four different ARPs here. We've got, so that's, yeah, that's the only one that's a, a replica. But the other, th this was actually my first analog synth, yeah. um, which is an axe, which is basically a cut down version of the Odyssey. So if you look at it, it's basically, it's pretty much an Odyssey without that top layer to it. Okay. Um, which is, so it's quite a primitive synth, but it, there's particular things it does really well. Like there's a kind of subby bass sound that I can get out of that. that it's just, my go-to sub bass sound for kind of putting under strings and stuff Un like your that. Under bass, as yeah, I call it. Exactly, yeah. And is that a vintage move? That is the modern reissue. Great, it looks beautiful. Yeah, and it, I mean, to my ears, that sounds really great. Um, I was at the time I bought it. It was roughly I could have got an a, original one for roughly the same price. But I just thought I've got so many synths that I'm always having to get repaired. It would be nice to have one that, yeah, hopefully, just works. <laughs> Particularly a workhorse. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, going back to the uh, Herbie Hancock picture, this was one of the real kind of um, key additions to the collection, um, and they're very difficult to get hold of. This is the Oberheim Four Voice, which I think is actually the first polyphonic analog synth. It's the first synth that could play a four-note chord. Daunting and complex to start with, but it's actually a very simple synth because it's. It's basically that replicated four times. So the synth. Ah. So the, so if you play four note, if you play a four note chord on it, you're just you know it's sending each of those notes to the four separate synths. Okay. So all you've got to learn is that little bit there, which right. is actually very simple. And it's basically a router from the the, the keyboard that routes yeah. to the different oscillators. Yeah, exactly. So you've got so that's what's going on down here. So Amazing. and then that's just a mixer between the four voices. So actually, being being hugely temperamental as these things are, currently I'm only really able to use it in two, two voice mode because the third voice has a crackle on it, and the fourth voice has just suddenly decided to completely bypass the filter cutoff. So it's now completely open and right. sounds massively huge and bright. Okay. Um, it's interesting. We we sampled some vintage synths with Olaf Arnolds for his composer toolkit, and um, he he kept on going, guys. Every time you send me something to, to check out, I change the voice count down to the voice count that the actual synth has, and you keep on putting it up to like 64, <laughs> because it doesn't sound like right. the synth if you can play more than six notes yeah. on it or whatever it was that yeah. it was. It was uh, I think, and this synth is one where it really shows the value of having the real synth rather than, you know, because you can get emulations of this one. But the thing about this is because it's, because it's sending each of the note to a different synth, you're having to set up the tuning and you know the filter and everything separately on those four notes, which means that they're never exactly the same. So, which is partly why it sounds so thick and huge sure. when when you play it, because it's got all those um, differences in the sound. You know, it's not it's not perfectly in tune. Um, and that was someone said to me recently about modern analog. That's the difference between modern analog synths and original vintage analog synths as well is that the kind of first generation ones, the components, the electronic components in them weren't as precise as they are now. And modern components are so precise that you don't get those little fluctuations of tuning that are part of what makes the the kind of character of the sound. So yeah, so I, I really feel that these instruments have something to offer, you know, now even though they're 40 years old. Right. And um, what's this beast underneath? Uh, this is a Yamaha CP30 electronic piano. So not an electric oh. piano, it's an electronic piano. So it's one of the early, um, so if you think of like a Rhodes or a Wurlitzer or something, yes. it's an electric piano. No, I'm familiar piano. with the sound of those, yeah. So they're, they're um, you know, they're electromechanical, so they work by amplifying a physical action. Whereas this is one of the first ones that's literally electronic circuitry inside it making the sound. 
So it's, um, yeah, it doesn't get a huge amount of use because basically that's one that's completely because of the Herbie Hancock picture. <laughs> right, <laughs> brilliant. And it was a massive eBay bargain. It was 150 quid off eBay, so. Um, Great stuff. But yeah, so I mean, so I've kind of set it up so that the ones that, that I do use the most are within easy reach. So the two, the two synths that are my real go-tos are the Juno and the Oberheim. And they're, they're both, you know, from where I'm sitting, I can just lean to either side for those. We've got an Oberheim expander there, which is, I've, I really wanted to get more of that 80s thick analog pad sound. Yeah. Which the other synths weren't offering so much. I mean, a lot of them are, mon uh, that area is kind of all monophonic. And I mean, the Juno gets, quite a bit of the way there. The Oberheim's just got a bit more kind of fizz and grit to those creamy pad sounds, and I just wanted a bit more of that, so that's what that one's offering. So, they, I mean, they all offer something different. There's no no real duplication of, of function. They're all offering something different. Amazing. And the Akai, do you...? Yes. Mm. I think, actually, in one of your vlogs once, you talked about I think you described it as a kind of Trent Reznor, Atticus Ross, Ross approach of, of you know, having a sampled sound that, that where the uh, yes. pitch is then, you know, literally transposing as you go up the keyboard and all of that. Yeah. And I mean, obviously you can do that with, with software samplers, but I just, I just wanted to get that grit of having a yeah. kind of slightly lo-fi sampler sampling sounds and then playing one sound across the time stretch keyboard. algorithms are interesting in, in those as well yeah. very very crude and and yeah in, in, a, in a good way good crude yeah so basically um it was making some amazing sounds but the problem i had with it is that it's incredibly slow to use yes i mean just you know and and you're and the sure. rsi from <laughs> yeah yeah exactly and just like even like you know the amount of time it takes to write in the name of a sample because you're having to like turn the wheel to get every letter and all that kind of thing so really, so I really enjoyed the process of it and the sounds I was getting and what that was doing musically, but just for deadlines and stuff that just wasn't working. So yeah. then I looked into the best way I could replicate that in the um, software environment. And so I found this thing called the Tal sampler. Oh, in here somewhere. I was waiting for the point at which I was going to end up spending some money. It's actually really affordable. Uh, I can't remember it's how much it is. It's still money but. though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but it's great. So it's basically, it's, you know, I mean, you, you could probably could do the same kind of things with EXS24 or yep. something like that, Contact. But I think, you know, it, I just felt that EXS24 and Contact are designed more for that more advanced kind of... Virtual instruments. Yeah, exactly. And I just wanted something that's designed for that grittier, getting, you know, just sampling a bit of sound and then making textures out of it and yeah i've just found this really interesting to use because you can even just sometimes i'll just drop a whole mix of a track in there and then just sample like a little bit of the track yeah. or like a you know that thing where there's there's i've had loads of times where like you hit stop and then you get an amazing reverb tail but it's not actually you know yeah i just thought it'd be great to just be able to capture that and use that reverb tail for something and so with this um yeah i'll sometimes just put a whole bounce of something in there and just chop off the reverb tail at the end and make make sounds out of that do you know what this has served as inspiration for me because as, as you may be or may not be aware i travel a lot absolutely and there's a lot of dead time and i'll use it to do editing and to write emails and stuff but i never ever use that time to fiddle around sonically or musically yeah and this looks like a good, a good. Yeah, it's great. It's great because you just. It's, it's, it's very simple because you just drop the audio file in here, and then you've got just a knob for where in the audio, fi audio file you're starting, where you're ending, and then you've got your loop start and end point, so you can loop things, and then you've got your envelope, so you just. Your so it's all front, front panel, brilliant. Um, and then it's got, in terms of getting that more um, kind of lo-fi degraded sound, it's got some emulations of things, so like S1000, so that's. You know, that's yes, obviously yeah. based on the Akai kind of approach. I mean, it's not, you know, it's not quite the same sound as if I did it with the Akai sampler, but the amount of time, I mean, the time difference is just wow. crazy. So, so yeah, so the, the Akai, that was something where kind of, you know, buying a bit of hardware got me thinking about a certain approach, 
yeah. that then I've tried to replicate in the software and that's led to something else. It's always great to see some Strymons all, all hooked up. Ah, they are yeah. very, uh, very much... They are very much part of, the, part of the process. So basically, if you look down here, I've got... I mean, everything, everything around the room, pretty much, is coming through these patch bays down here. And so I can pretty much loop anything through anything to some extent. Right. So basically, thing, things that are further away on the other side of the room, like the ARP and the um, Selena and actually the Oberheim as well, they, they go into, they're basically looped to, they're connected up to little patch bays yep. that then go into DI boxes. Um, that then, so every, anything that's coming through DIs is coming down to this XLR patch bay here. Great. And the reason for that is just, um, I think when you've got longer cable lengths, it's just um, safer to go through DI boxes so you don't get, you know, if everything's line level cables, then you're more likely to get hum and interference. Right. So it's just really easy for me to then connect up any of the synths from there to the front panel of the RME interface. But then the things that are closer by are just coming in with sure. jack line level into this patch bay. Um, but then I've also got like the Strymons and stuff coming into there. There's some old effects processes like that Yamaha mm. one down there. And is the M7, the Brocaster, your kind of go-to haul verb? It was for a while. And then just for workflow-wise, it stopped making sense in terms of stems and things. So I was mixing in here, but I'm not set up for surround in here. You know, some projects get up mixed from stereo to surround, but yeah. then I had a project where I absolutely had to deliver it in surround. So more recently I've been mixing, um, actually with Gertz, Bots and Hart, who I think you oh, know. Great. Uh, what's, what's your go-to hall verb? Uh, fab filter now. It's great, isn't it? Yeah, exactly. No dongle as well is really yeah. important for... I don't do a lot of taking stuff from here and putting it on the laptop, but when I do, it's really great to just be able to transfer it really Absolutely. easy and have the same plugins. So a couple of bits I've noticed. This looks yeah. like a very interesting bit of kit. Yeah, that's a, um, it's called a, a, a mesclin. It's, a, it's actually, I think it's kind of Eurorack compatible, but Eurorack is something that I've deliberately avoided Getting yes, into I, I'd, I'd <laughs> continue being deliberately avoidant. <laughs> I mean, I think I, as you, I, you know, I've, I've, I've enough got enough, enough. <laughs> I've got enough gear that I'm uh, obsessed with. So, um, but yeah, it's just a really interesting little synth. I just saw. I think it was a like, I think it was kind of crowdfunded originally, and there was um, just some stuff online about it, about them building it, and um, it just looked really interesting. And in some of the videos, it was making some sounds that I thought I could okay. really apply to stuff. Starting a new project, it, I kind of allocate some of my budget to new sounds, basically, because yes. that can inspire, yes, you know, just be advice, really inspirational yeah. for as a starting point. So most projects I've done, I've kind of bought some new gear for it. And then... A reward. As well. Yeah, yeah. Well I mean, it's, you know, Good pitching. Can't say it's not fun, but... Absolutely. Um, but it, that really helps kind of find a sound world for the project and something oh, a bit different. Um, so, yeah, going back to kind of finding sounds as a source for inspiration and a starting point for things. So I'd, I'd known about this instrument called the Waterphone for a long time. I think it was the score for Chinatown by Jerry Goldsmith, which right. is just one of my absolute favorite film scores. I just think it's a total masterpiece. Um, and yeah, this instrument um, was a key part of that. And it was uh, on that score, it was performed by a really legendary L.A. Um, kind of s film score session percussionist called Emile Richards. And um, I think it had been recently invented as an instrument around then in California. Um, and yeah, just that score is a really kind of one of the earliest places that it was heard. But it's, um, so I was aware of, aware of it for a long time and then I found that there's, um, this is actually one made in Poland, which I think, so I think it's technically an aquaphone, um, but it just makes some beautiful sounds.
it's almost ambisonic, isn't it? It's a very 3D sound. Oh yeah, absolutely. And um, and yeah, so I like I recorded it by setting up a pair of 414s, and then you can make it sound really, you know, if you've got a pair of 414s on as a kind of spaced omni pair, and then you're moving this around, you can get this huge. And so, it, this looks suspiciously wired up, the Sony. Do it you, absolutely is wired up. Yeah, I mean, I do use that quite a lot. So in what context? So I've done stuff where I've, I've recorded sounds to it, whatever they are, like so either sample based or synth based onto the tape and then played the tape back at half speed. So one of the really good things about this, this Sony one is it's got three different speeds. OK. Which basically means you can record stuff and pitch it down an octave or pitch it down two mm -hmm. octaves. What I've done is, you know, played stuff out of it and then through all the pedals and that's a um, tape delay there. So. The copycat. Yeah, and starting and stopping the tape, kind of, you know, you can have, the, and then having it going into the copycat and having the gain as kind of, you know, you can use the gain then as a kind of um, envelope for how the, how you're shaping the sure, of amplitude course. of the sound, um, and then from there into the various different pedals down, you know, some pedals hidden away down here, like the heliotrope and stuff. Oh, I love the heliotrope. Um, and then. So there's, yeah, that side to it, which is kind of making sounds by tape. So actually, there, I first got into that when um, when I was doing a, a BBC period drama called The Woman in White. Yes. And we were looking for a kind of different approach to the sound. I'd watched this um, film around about then um, called The Offence, um, which is a 70s Sydney Lumet film. Um, but it's the only film score by Harrison Birtwistle. Oh wow! And it's a really interesting score. Um, there, where and there's a little on the Blu-ray. There was a little documentary about um, an interview with him about about how he approached the score. And basically, he he wrote the music and then took it into a kind of early seventies um, electroacoustic studio and chopped it all up to picture. Oh, how so he kind of wrote the music and then and then kind of shaped it to picture after the music was written. And so that just got me thinking about, you know, because obviously the technology at that time would have all been based on tape, um, tape manipulation. So that just set me thinking about what kind of sounds I could get by messing around with tape like that. So, so yeah, this little corner is the kind of tape and tape delay. Amazing. Um, but you can get um, just some, because I've yeah been messing around with it, you can get some lovely sounds. Like one thing I do is put the one of your Spitfire strings libraries, the yeah. um, Oliver Arnold's chamber strings, through that because it's got that love lovely legato shape to it. Yeah, you know, so I'll take some, you know, make some kind of pad textures out of that with loads of reverb and delay. Record them into the um, into the tape deck and then um, play it back at half speed, and you can just get some lovely because you bet. know the tape adds some kind of flutter and everything to it as well. Brilliant. Um, so you can get some lovely textures that way. Um, so yeah, I mean, a lot of it is, it's about kind of ways of making sound basically and shape, a lot of it's shaping sound. I, I just, for anyone who doesn't make their own sounds, um, writer's block is a possibility. But if you make sounds, yeah, it, I just, mean, it's just, it's just it doesn't exist in my world. When I started out, I just had the laptop in front of me. Yeah. I didn't really even have any um, plugins or anything else. Basically, it was just a laptop with logic. And so initially, I was, I was really trying to work out how to make, you know, the samples I had weren't good enough to pass as real instruments at that point. And so I really got into just chopping things up and using just the logic plugins to pitch shift things, delays, distortion all those things to make different sounds. And that seemed to be working well. Everything in here has a different way of functioning and you know, it forces you to look at things in a different way and, and approach the creation of sound in a different way. And because all of them are hugely limited. I mean, that is the one thing that unifies yeah. all of these yeah. stuff that, that's out of the box. And you know, you finding this, this sampler, I can see it's, it, it, it definitely has limitations. We're yeah. not going to be able to yeah. program a, an orchestral with, with uh, portamento legato articulations in it. And no, it, no, exactly, yeah. exactly. And I think, yeah, part of the problem, like for me, if I'm just sitting at a computer with a blank logic page and you've got contact completely full of all these different options, you know, all those things are really valuable, but 
to do something um, that sound that sounds different and is really going to inspire me to you know on a path to the the sounds of the score, then you know just stepping away from that and and having the, you know imposing those limitations can be really really valuable. Amazing. Um, this is the first studio I've been in. Are these Neumann speakers? Yeah. Happy um, with those? Very. Yeah. KH three tens. They um, they were a little bit of an impulse purchase, so I didn't actually try them before I got them. So I was going to buy a pair of barefoots, um, and then I went into KMR in North London, um, and they they taught me into these ones, which but I'm completely happy with them. They're, they're brilliant. I used it was I had um, Adam A sevens right. before that, and I always found them a little bit bright and I was always worried that my I was kind of rolling off the top end of stuff and then when I heard it elsewhere it sounded a bit dull yeah so um, but these seem much more balanced and I don't have a subwoofer I used to have a subwoofer in here and I always found it really difficult judging the bass yeah and I think this is this is a fairly bassy room because of the side of the room I need to I need to improve the bass traps at some point but it means that when I had the subwoofer, it was quite bassy in here, and again, it meant that I was really rolling off the bass end. And then yeah. when I heard it elsewhere, gone. the bass had gone. Yeah. So, whereas the, yeah, these feel like they're a good, they're good balance, and they're just um, really the, the amount of clarity they've got is is really great. So, a couple of things. You're you're obviously working Logic. Do you run Picture in Logic too? Um, so I actually hidden away behind there is a Mac Mini which is what this screen is. Mm -hmm. So I actually um, have Logic running on there, but just for running the picture. So that's the overarching, the, the project sequence. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So, so I used to run um, Vienna Ensemble Pro on there for all the samples. Yeah. Which, with a previous iteration of the main computer, was necessary, um, like power-wise. Yeah. Power so this is an iMac Pro, is it? It's actually just an old. It's a normal iMac. Um, very powerful. It's not. It's it's it was the. It's it's getting on a bit now. It's about five years old, but it was the most powerful one when I bought it. But uh, that was before the Mac, uh, the iMac Pro. Yeah. So it's not massively powerful, but it works fine. Because I don't tend to work with huge number of. Well, this tracks. is the, another question I was going to say. Is is I think the the tide is turning away from massive templates, which I think yeah. Vienna Ensemble really facilitated. Yeah. And also because it was on a separate machine, you didn't really want to change the template because you couldn't retrospectively work through different projects. And yeah. But it's problematic, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, I think I just realized that I wasn't the kind of composer who worked with a big template. I, I feel like every project, I just feel like I need to find find the sounds, you know, not, yeah. not be selecting them. And um, so basically every project now and even every every queue, I basically just start with a blank logic page that looks like that. It's got nothing nothing loaded up. And um, as you work through kind of multi episodic, how does that kind of So I um so I might use like a previous queue as the template. Right. Okay. Um you know particular strands of the narrative um, will you know will evolve and I'll I'll, I'll return I'll, I'll think well that cue was that part of the narrative yeah. I'll use that as the structure for okay for and do you find on. yourself kind of getting master cues kind of the ones that you go that's got a bit of everything that we need with that strand in so yeah sort of but also I mean I d a lot of what I do is with audio right. so so a lot of it is so yeah I mean sometimes I will use audio that's recorded from the synth and chop it up and mm -hmm. rejig it to the new scene but quite a lot of the time I'm kind of recording new stuff in so yeah I mean basically they're the ones that are midied up that's more so I can if I need to do something kind of quantized yeah or like yes. a pulsating baseline or something it's I can not run for, the midi it's not kind of for recall no know. no there's the, I mean there's no recall basically <laughs> <laughs> I mean look at them <laughs> yeah. um, it's also, I mean, I, the, the thing is, you know, uh, this is a genuine concern with something like the Oberheim, is that it's not just a matter of not being able to recall, it's just it might not work tomorrow. Oh, absolutely, yeah. I mean, commit it. Oh, yeah, no, exactly. I mean, that was the thing, like, that was like a week or so ago, that voice just suddenly decided to lock completely yeah. open on a massively bright sounding, huge 
you know, filter setting. So yeah, yeah, I have to record stuff in. And yeah, and like the, the other row behind that, a um, couple of weeks, a few weeks ago, that just suddenly decided to add an extra out of tune pitch to one of the six voices in it. Sure. So it just suddenly became unusable, basically. And I'd been using it as quite a central part of the project I was doing. But luckily I'd recorded enough, enough audio that I could then chop up what I had yeah. while I was getting it repaired. And then now it's back, I can use it again. So um, I've got, got th three kind of fixed questions that I always like to ask in, in, in these circumstances. But I don't wish ill on your studio. So if some phantom destructive force um, yeah. uh, was, was, was over the horizon coming towards your studio and you could just grab one piece of equipment, what would that be? Um, of the hardware, probably the Juno, um, which uh, is weird because it's the only synth really that doesn't fit my Herbie Hancock scheme of it's schematic. Synth, <laughs> synth duration. Studio schematic. Yeah, um, but it's just it's just it's just makes great sounds. I mean, it's it's a really it's a simple like you were saying primitive. I mean, it, it is a primitive synth. I mean, look at it. It's not there's not that much you can do with it in terms of the controls, but just the sounds that come out of it yeah. are really they just work for for film and TV music. Um, I, I have one, I, and I just I call it musical. It's musical. It is Whilst musical. the sounds are primitive, yeah. I said, there are some synths where it's primitive and you go, and horrid. Yeah, but that's just primitive and sounds great. Um, is it a 60 or it's a, a six? six? It's a six you got. Because yeah. I used to have a, I originally had a 106, but it just, it, it, one, for me, the 106 has got a bit of harshness to it. Yeah. Um, and also, I mean, it was playing up all the time, so eventually I just decided to switch it for a six and to me, that just sounds so much yeah, nicer. Absolutely. I mean, it's basically, functionally, it's pretty much the same synth, but there's just something about the sound of the six that just really works brilliantly well. And if um, you've just come out of the National Film and Television, is it the National Film and Television School? Yeah. Yeah, if you've just come out of the, the National Film and Television School, and as you know, you suggested, you've got your laptop, what would be your advice for people, you know, with kind of creating a sound, finding their own voice, you know, I always think it's very important to go, you know, it's not necessary to buy all of this kit in order to to get started. Oh, definitely, definitely. I mean, yeah, you just, I, I think it's it's uh, it's a lot better now because, I mean, the things you've been doing with Spitfire and, you know, the sounds that people can have access Thank to you. now, like with all the lab stuff and everything is amazing. I mean, that didn't exist when I was, I was starting out. So I think people can, in terms of what you can do just with yeah. a laptop now, there's... Um, like an amazing array of sounds. But then also, yeah, I think just find ways to manipulate the sound as well. So you're just not, not just using presets and things. Fill, you know, find, find ways of making it sound like you, mm -hmm. you know, the sounds that, that you love. Um, so for me, I mean, I do loads of stuff with um, automation mm -hmm. to really shape the sound. Yeah. So things like I have, I mean, if in any of my projects, I have the number of kind of plugins I have on each channel strip get a bit silly sometimes. But a lot of it is just I use gain the gain pro, um, plugin in Logic a lot, and I have it at different stages of the signal chain. So, and I just use that to shape the. It's basically the envelope of the sound, um, and you can do so much to shape sounds like that. And then also kind of automating. Um, like reverb levels and distortion levels and things like that. Just automating kind of subtle distortion coming in and out on things. Final question. A anything on your shopping list? <laughs> Bucket list? Um, the CS80. That's the one that's kind of missing. Um, but no, not really. I, I think I've reached a point where this feels like a really good setup for me. This, yeah. really, this really works for me. So no, nothing kind of, nothing uh, pressing at the moment. I feel, yeah, I, I feel like I've kind of streamlined it to the the bits of kit that really work for the way I approach things. Um, so, yeah, like eventually far in the future, the CS80 is, 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 is kind of, I, I feel like that's in my future somewhere, but um, no, apart from that, I think uh, nothing, nothing pressing. Brilliant stuff. Um, so 
dear Santa, John's got to be a really, really good boy <laughs> in order for him to be obliging with the CS80. John, thank you so much thank for your you, time. Christian. It's a really wonderful space. And uh, do subscribe if you haven't done. Lots of these fascinating videos. Indeed, a video with John coming up. And ding that bell if you want to be notified the next time uh, I put a video up. One of these for this fantastic space would be much appreciated. See you next time.